scripture tells us that sufficient is the strength for the day. Did you know that? Your strength is sufficient for every day. The scripture says that. God is our strength. We cannot do it. We cannot do it. Which is a good thing. Because we have to depend upon the Lord. He is our strength. He's our help. And depend on him. Lean on him. He loves for you to do that. Like when you ask your husband to do something, oh, it makes them feel very good that they have something they can do for you. They love Men love to do things, to fix it. Fix it. I want to fix it. And boy, if they have a chance to fix it, they love to do that for you and that you trust them to do that. And the Lord wants to fix it. He's told us, you know, just come to me. I, I love to fix it. Let me do that for you.
waiting for you to fail. He's not waiting to try to catch you in something that you're doing wrong. We live in a world like that, but that's not God. God wants you to succeed. He wants you to be faithful. He wants, you, he wants to do whatever he has to do. He's given his son, but God wants you to succeed. He wants you to, to, he wants you to be in heaven with him. And God's not waiting to try to nap you on the top of the head and say you failed again. No, 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 no. God is a loving God. And if he corrects us, he does it in mercy and love because he wants us to make heaven. He wants us to make heaven. And I want you to think of this song about the fact that it reiterates what Scripture says. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you.
spirit while we've been singing we had leaders in the scripture like Moses who led into his old days didn't stop leading and David led into his old days and then we have Eli and I want to tell you this the Lord put this in my heart while we were singing if you do not keep your hand close to the Lord's and keep getting refilled with that Spirit of God, what's going to happen is you're going to fall off of your seat. You will fall off of your seat. The Scripture tells us that you do not retire. You do not retire just because you get to be 70 or 80 or 90 or 100. You don't retire. You continue to serve the Lord. That does not stop. And you, res you serve him with all of your energy, you, whatever that is for the day. If you don't have energy like yesterday, so be it. But you say, God, I give you everything I have today. Because the scripture tells us to worship him in the lack of strength. We don't do it because we feel like it or for we have enough strength. But Eli did not stay where he was supposed to be with the Lord. He was still doing all the stuff he was supposed to do, but there was nothing inside. He was an empty vessel. And the scripture says he fell off of his stool, broke his neck and died. His sons, Phineas and Hophni, Hophni and Phineas, had been killed in battle, and, and that was his sons were his all of his life, and he oh they were just everything to him. Well, they were out doing horrible things, in the tabernacle, doing awful stuff, and going out into battle. And God allowed them to be killed because they were not living for God like what their father had shown them to do, and He did not stop them. He didn't stand in their way and make it impossible. He just let it go because that's my son, my son. And all he could think of when they died is, my son's dead, my son's dead. Well, he was devoid of the presence of the Lord. And God allowed him to fall off of his stool and break his neck. God gave that to me this morning. That's not something that I thought of ahead of time. God spoke that to me and said, speak this to the congregation, and I did. <clears throat> so that's God's word. So what it says to us is stay full of the Holy Spirit. Stay within the discerning powers of the Lord. Be full of the direction of God. Whatever he tells you to do, you direct your family the way he tells you to. You be the light and the lead for your family. And God will honor that. You stop doing that, and what happens is you lose your authority. Because our authority is not in ourself. Our authority is not because you're the oldest or because you're the smartest or because you have the most money or because you have the most tenure. Your authority is because God's given it to you. And the Lord tells us to stay full of the Holy Ghost. Stay, you know, stay, keep your, your lamp filled with oil so that when you need to say something to your family and, they, and that your light is bright enough that it will cause there to be consternation and they'll say, Come, Pappy, Grandma, Mom, Dad, 
brother, sister, help me. I'm, I'm lost. I know I'm lost. God's been talking to me. And then you lead them. You don't just say, I'm just so glad you're my son, and we're so proud of you. You're doing such. No, you say, I am proud of you, but God must be speaking to you about your relationship with the Lord. So let's just stop here and put your hand on them and say, in the name of Jesus, I'm going to pray over you. And you begin to pray. Pray the Spirit of God down. I'm telling you, that's what works, is when you allow the Lord to be the leader in your home. Father, in the name of Jesus, whatever it is that you're causing this this morning, I just ask for the presence of the Holy Ghost to come upon our families, upon each person, Lord, that we would take the lead that you've given to us. You've established us in that place for whatever reason, Father. Help us to be honest with our time and with our spirit and be the kind of a leader that we need to be, Lord. We want to go out whenever we do go out, Lord. We want to go out victorious worshiping you and leaving a clear light for the people who are following us in the name of jesus thank you father thank you father praise the lord sing this and we'll have brother drake take it think about his love think about his goodness think about his But here we are at Psalm 139. This isn't Proposition 139. This is Psalm 139. Whether shall I go from thy spirit, or whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there, shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me it's a wonderful passage it is declaring the omnipresence of god there is no place in this universe that god is not there's no place that you go that god won't know where you are and what you're doing even if your choice is to reject God and the hope of heaven and you choose to be disobedient and find yourself in judgment and damned to hell, even God's spirit and presence is, has dominion and control. Jeremiah 23, verse 23 and 24. Jeremiah 23, verse 23 and 24. Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord? It might be easier for you to understand. Is God a God that's close to you? That's what that's saying. And not a God far off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? saith the Lord. Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord. Again, God's omnipresence. Everywhere, present, all time, 24-7. God is in our midst at all times. We may not even be aware that he is there. Such things uh, I've heard through the years. Oh, I really love it when God shows up. He always shows up. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be in the midst of them. Scripture reveals God's deep desire 
to be in a relationship with mankind so great a desire that he determines I will be everywhere they are every moment of their day and night no matter what. Just think about that. I don't know, humanly, if there's anyone that you would say, uh, I'd want them to be with me every second of every day and of every night. I would never want them to be anywhere except for where I am. There's sometimes that you may feel like, I don't want to see your face. Go away. Go find something to do. But God does not do that, does not feel that way, even when we are resisting and disobeying him he wants to be with us sometimes people make statements like God really showed up in worship today he shows up every time we worship or when God appears to be absent if we pray harder maybe the Holy Spirit will show up <laughs> it really goes back to an old saying that's been around longer than I have and it says we need to learn to let go and let God have his way because he has a plan every time we come together he has something he wants to do I think I know what people mean when they say those things but I'm concerned that it creates an unhealthy pattern in our mind and heart that we have to do something to get God to show up All you have to do is turn your mind and your heart toward him and you're going to have the opportunity to see that he is with you. It resembles those thoughts and thinkings, resembles Elijah's experience on Mount Carmel when the prophets of Baal, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 27, after their initial efforts failed, including shouting and screaming to Baal, cutting themselves. Elisha began to talk them, and he said, Shout louder! Surely he is a god. Perhaps he's in deep thought, or busy, or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping, and you need to awake him. No. All you need to do is turn your heart, your thoughts, and your spirit toward God because He is right there, ready to pour into your life. Ready to heal. Ready to give wisdom. Ready to bring peace. Ready to tell you that if you will do what He's saying, it will bring victory and blessing. God's presence is not something that we create by our efforts. It is there because he chose to be a God that was everywhere, all the time, present. How many have ever thought about that way? God literally designed it to be that we would never be anywhere at any time under any circumstance without him. In reality, God is always present, never absent. He never needs to be awakened. Scripture says he never sleeps and he never slumbers. He never grows weary. He's ready to help. Ready to be there for what you need him to do. Hallelujah. Acts 17, 27, that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Every one of us. Seek after him that you might happily find that he is there because he said, I will not be far from you, I will be with every one of you. 
Isaiah 55, 6 and 7, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. So this is not just a believer, Christian, good person relationship. This is even for the worst of the sinners. And God said, I'll be there for you and I will abundantly pardon you if you turn your heart toward me. I will forgive you, wash you clean and welcome you into my presence. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot, and blameless. Our offense is our doing. Our anger is our creation. Our feelings of not being loved or liked is our doing. Because scripture says as believers those who have believed on Christ and receive Him, if you allow Him to come into your life, He will transform you so that you are a fruit-bearing, spiritual fruit-bearing person that has love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, and temperance. Against such there is no law. But if you're going to act, don't, don't expect people to love you. If you're going to have a mean spirit, don't expect people to want to be around you. If you're coming with an accusation against the Lord, don't expect Him to agree. Amen? Because He always is who He is. He never changes no matter what we do or don't do. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's always there for us and ready to forgive us, cleanse us, help us, love us, and give us blessing and victory. Let's look at Jonah for a moment. Jonah was languishing in the belly of a fish because of disobedience. The great storm came. It was going to kill everybody on the ship. And he tells the men, if you throw me over, you'll be saved because this storm is a judgment from God because I disobeyed God. I'm in trouble and you're being affected by it because you're with me and I'm with you and I'm getting judged. Jonah was swallowed by the big fish that God prepared, Scripture says. Jonah spent three turbulent days and nights in the belly of the fish. At the end of those three days, Jonah cried out to the Lord, chapter 2, verse 4. Then I thought, this is Jonah, then I thought I have been banished from your sight, will I ever see your holy temple again? Now this was Jonah's thought. This is the way Jonah felt after three days and nights in the belly of a creature that God created to swallow him. Kept him from drowning. I don't know if you've done much fish cleaning or fishing. But boy, I'm so glad that the stink and the slime that you have to endure to catch them and clean them is not the same when you clean them and eat them. Otherwise, I'd never eat fish. Can you imagine being in the belly of a fish three days and three nights and listen to the thought that came to Jonah's mind? Jonah 2, 4. Then I thought, I have been banished from your sight. Will I ever see your holy temple again? In other words, will God ever forgive me? Will he ever welcome me? Will he ever treat me with anything less than disdain? It took three days and nights, a great storm, and to be thrown overboard three days and nights in the belly of a creature that God created to come to that thought. I do not like to be absent from God.
As soon as you're willing to let God have his way, he is right there to help you find it. God was there in the fish. He knew what was thinking and feeling going on, not only in the fish's stomach. I'm sure he wasn't happy. Got this rebellious food that he swallowed down in there that's creating some anxiety for the fish. Jonah did not realize the value of any of it. Jonah found himself smelly, dark, without hope, and absent from God before he understood that he had lost the benefit of being able to go to God's presence. There is nothing more important in our life than knowing God and being in a right relationship with Him. Look at the prayer of Samson, Judges chapter 16, verse 28. Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me. I pray thee only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. Do you remember the story of Samson? He allowed himself to get involved with a heathen, unbeliever woman and he disobeyed the laws of God and finally betrayed the confidence God had placed in him that he was going to be a judge and someone he could depend on to defeat the enemies of Israel but because he put this woman first on a regular basis and then divulged something that was secret between him and God they came and cut his hair while he was sleeping. And that was a symbol between him and the Lord of God's blessing and strength upon his life. So they were able to defeat him, able to burn his eyes out and put him in prison. And I want you to see what happened. This is not a total repentance. We don't see that picture here. What we see is Samson utterly devastated without God's anointing, without God's favor, blind, unable to care for himself, imprisoned, and this is his prayer. He called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee. Strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once. This is a desperate, confused prayer. As I read it multiple times, it's, it's a man who has now realized how far he is from God and how deep in the depths and dregs of sin and dishonor and disobedience he had fallen. Not like David saying, Lord, bring me back. Bring me back to a right heart, a right spirit. Renew in me the joy of thy salvation. That's not the prayer. God, if you'll just do this one thing for me, remember me that I may be avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. Judges 16.20 This is the lady he fell in love with. She shouted, Samson, the Philistines are coming. He woke up and thought, I'll get loosed and go free as always. And he did not know that the Lord had left him. Look at me with the life of King Saul. We need to always live with an awareness that the Holy Spirit knows us, knows what we're going through, knows why, and knows what needs to happen. Always knows. 
He's present around us 24-7. And yet here it says, we read 1 Samuel 10, 1, Samuel took the flask of olive oil and poured it upon Saul's head, kissed him and said, the Lord has anointed you to be ruler of his people Israel. You will rule his people and save them from all their enemies. This will be a sign that the Lord has anointed you to be ruler of his people. Now listen, as soon as Saul was anointed as king, the Spirit of the Lord came and rested upon him so that he was capable, able to prophesy along with all of God's other prophets. He became king, but he came equal to all the other prophets in the kingdom because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Nonetheless, Saul did not honor God. Consequence of his action, 1 Samuel 16, 14, now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. When the presence of God departed from Saul, he also lost the kingly anointing and authority that God had entrusted him with. Saul did not comprehend what was happening. Saul became proudful, arrogant, boastful. He became abusive. The person that God chose to replace Saul, he tried to kill him multiple times. This is a man who had lost his faith in God, lost his relationship with God, lost the anointing of God, and lost the ability to spiritually do what God had asked him to do. So a boy has to come and deliver the kingdom, defeat Goliath the giants, and send the Philistines running. Because a man who God had chose to pour himself upon and use mightily lost his way. Quickly, let's look at Exodus 33. Moses said to him, if your presence is not going with us, don't make us leave this place. How will anyone ever know you're pleased with your people and me unless you go with us? And then we will be different from all of the people on the face of the earth. Moses understood something at this point that was significant. He needed the presence of God in his life. And he needed God to be there to help him with the people. Amen? So often we take the presence of God for granted. We need to sincerely and consistently put God first in all we do, say, think, and feel. So often we find ourselves compromised and without strength and without ability and in trouble because we made the decision to do things as a person who felt, I'm a servant of God. I have God's anointing. I have an education. I've studied. I've learned. I've applied myself. I've got experience. But you see, none of that really has any importance if it's not under God's leadership. All we do can end up in vain and compromise us and cause us to be lost without God because we were not following the leadership and the anointing of God's Spirit. Exodus 33, something important about Moses. The Lord said to him, 33, 17 of Exodus, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. God knew Moses' name, absolutely. He knows your name. But at that point, God knew something about Moses the person that Moses himself was not confident in. And that is that with God, Moses could do everything God wanted him to do. 
and he wouldn't have to worry about failing. Let's take quickly the prayer of David. Psalm 51, 11. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. David pleaded with God for his presence after he found himself, Nathan the prophet had visited the throne room and talked to David about a man who had done some very awful things. And, <clears throat> and David was saying, Nathan said, what would you do? with a person like this in your kingdom. And David made a response that he did not even realize he was the one Nathan was talking about. He was sentencing himself and his family to be cast out and killed and buried in a grave with no name so that no one would ever know or think about him again. But David prays, repents, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He also appealed to God that he should not take away his life and the Holy Spirit. So we've looked at Jonah, Samson, Saul, David, Moses, all whom prayed different prayers for different reasons prayed to God only when they found themselves away from God's presence, out of God's approval, and at the point of death. Jonah disobeyed God and was going in the opposite direction instead of where God wanted him. Samson lost focus of his calling and continued in a life of sin until he was killed. Saul disobeyed God and did those things that God forbade him to do. Lost the kingdom. His family was destroyed except for Mephibosheth. David in the heights of glory sinned and displeased God. But he came to the horns of the altar and would not let go. Until God showed up, forgave him, cleansed him, gave him a right spirit. Amen. And Moses was pleading with God on behalf of the Israelites who sinned against God and then became so frustrated and angry. I don't know about you, uh, I, I never anticipated it, it's really bothered me the last few years. I, I, I never anticipated what was going to be happening to me. to the church, to our world, to our nation. I, I have to confess, I, I did not perceive the magnitude of what was going to be developing. And I find myself spending significant time talking to the Lord about helping me keep my composure as a servant of God. Because I find myself frustrated. I find myself at times becoming angry. I find myself wanting to take action out of my own thought and emotion and set it in order. Instead of remembering this is God's people, God's house. This is God's world. And I'm God's servant. And I need to be in tune with God. He's the judge. He's the voice that causes the mountains to tremble. He's the one that when he draws close, his holiness brings rebuke and conviction. I don't need to do that. How many are hearing me today? I lived in a time, and it's not been unlike times before, but it's worse today. In a time where God's people have become so critical and judgmental. And we seem to react with such fervor and disdain to those who blatantly commit sin. Let me understand what pastors say. 
and we will shun them. We will rebuke them. We will stand against them. We will have a lot of accusation and a lot of how dare them do this. And yet God has called us all to pray and to restore those who have lost their way. And he says, this is the way I want you to do it. Not with accusation, not with judgment, not with finding faults, not with holding them accountable. I want you to restore them in a spirit of love. Is that God's word? And yet we struggle with it, don't we? The very thing that redeemed us, brought us to God and gave us confidence to trust Him was that He showed love to us. And the first thing He did, He said to the woman who was brought to her from the bed of adultery, He said, where are thine accusers? And He had written. You know, this, this is interesting about our Heavenly Father. He is the judge of the universe. He knows all things. He knows the where, when, what, and how. And he knows the details. And yet Jesus, while he was on earth, knowing, having all ability, all knowledge, all understanding, and all the fullness of the Godhead invested in Jesus while he was on earth. He kneels as people have gathered around the woman. And he writes in the dirt where no one else can see but who's standing. He didn't say it publicly so that others could hear. He wrote it in the dirt, dirt as they had gathered around him and the woman laying there in the dirt. And as they saw what he was writing, they were rebuked because the Holy Spirit was telling them, that's you. And they walked away without saying another word. They had come with stones. They were going to kill her. And they said, if you are the Messiah, if you're the Son of God you claim to be, you ought to cast the first stone. You with me? This is heavy. The whole community's watching. The church leaders are on display as rebuking this awful sinner. But Jesus doesn't expose their sin to the people. Does he? He writes in the dirt where only they could see. And as he looks up, and they've all walked away. Because scripture says, he who is without sin, you cast the first stone. And listen to the words of the Lord as we come to a close this morning. Where are thine accusers, woman? She looks up in fear, I'm sure in anguish, and a face covered with dust and dirt and tears. She said, there are none. Listen to the words of the Son of God. Neither do I condemn thee? Go and sin no more. That's the heart of our Father. God's not about making us squirm. He didn't do that to any of these men. And I was telling Don, I think Friday, I said, you know, as I've rehearsed all these lies in Old and New Testament alike, look at the disciples. I mean, it, it's disturbing to me that the people God chooses and the people that He has used don't stay faithful. They allow things to come between them and God. They allow things to come closer to them than what they allow God to. And it cost them all. Look at the multiple times Israel has abandoned and rebelled against God and he comes back with love and mercy and grace and forgiveness. That's the heart of God. 
your presence, Lord. He doesn't show up to embarrass us or remind us, as Don said, how utterly weak and carnal we are. He shows up to love us. He shows up to heal us. He shows up to say, let me dust you off. In fact, let me give you a new garment. Let me, let me reach into your heart and take that which is hardened and bitter and hurt and broken and pull it out and give you a brand new heart. And then don't worry about what people say or think. I'm going to walk with you. No one can harm you while I'm with you. And I will never leave you. That overwhelms my heart. When I think about it, I sit and weep. Because I am unworthy. that the King of Heaven should come and die for me and then spend 2,000 years praying for me and you. Now, Father, these words are words that you placed upon my heart. This is something that is for your people. I pray, Lord, that you would remove every barrier whether it's real or imagined, whether it's Satan that has come in and deceived and made us feel separated, or whether it's our actions and attitudes that cause us, Lord, to step away from your presence, or whether, Lord, we have given ourselves over to receive wrong counsel, not of your spirit, O oh Lord, return to us today and touch us with the presence and power of your divine Holy Spirit. Take away any barrier, any, any thought, any emotion, any words, any deed, anything, Lord, that would cause us to not be able to be fully in your presence and to know, Lord, that you are watching over us that you are walking beside us, that your spirit is within us and upon us. When David woke up and realized what had happened, he tore his kingly garments and ran to your temple, took a hold of the horns of the altar and begin to plead for your forgiveness, for your love, for your peace to be restored. For you not to cast him away. Oh, thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you for your gentle love. Thank you, Lord, that you continue to be such a patient God and Father and friend. We reach out to touch you today, Lord, by faith, to know that you're there. Would you take our hand, Lord, and would you lay your hand upon us, and would you, Lord, renew us with the right spirit? Bring back the anointing, Lord. Quicken us. We pray these things in the most wonderful name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.